Okay, here we go. The historic 1988 US Open and why I missed it. This will be part six, the ongoing I read P3 to you during quarantine times. The biggest event in snowboarding was, and still is, the US Open, held yearly at Stratton Mountain, Vermont. It was the first contest that Burton Snowboards really got behind and helped to organize. This is back when the US Open was at Stratton. I believe this is like three years before, this book was written three years before uh, the US Open's move to uh, Vail, its new home now. Um, it was the talk of snowboarding circles the world over. Joel Muzzy describes it as the Olympics, Mardi Gras, and a mosh pit rolled up into one insane week of competitive snowboarding. Since it's an open event, anyone can qualify. Every year since 1986, snowboarders from all around the world have converged at Stratton to try their luck against the international field or just to watch the best snowboarding on the planet. Back then, it was probably the closest thing that snowboarding had to a world championship, even though it was the U.S. Open. Of course, to the mainstream, snowboarding was still a fringe sport. The International Olympic Committee, the IOC, considered it a fad that was about as, a, about as athletic as sledding on a silver saucer. The majority of ski areas didn't allow us on the slopes because they considered us an insurance liability and didn't want to upset their long-time skiing clientele. Money would eventually change the minds of ski resorts in the IOC, but in the winter of 1988, we were outcasts viewed negatively, or at least warily, by public opinion. This only fueled the fire of the snowboarding youth movement. I was determined to get to the 1988 US Open, but my car had been acting up ever since the ram it into reverse at 50 miles an hour incident. I wasn't ready for the level of competition, but I wanted to watch Kidwell and other top pros kill it in what was predicted to be the best half pipe the world had ever seen. Instead, I ended up teaching a kid how to not break his wrist while he fell repeatedly and a half day lesson at Gunstock. I later found out that week that the half pipe had been insane. A pro skater, Turned snowboarder, sometimes hairdresser, named Bert Lamar took second in the men's pro division by pulling hand plants and miller flips. And Kidwell won by doing a huge slaw bear, methods, mutes, and a 540 helicopter. Yeah, they weren't really calling them spins back then. I wasn't really into racing, but Andy Coughlin, full-fledged veteran by that time, won the downhill event 100th of a second ahead of West Germany's Peter Bauer. The Euros were, new, were known for kicking ass and racing, in bad and also bad fashion. When, America, when an American local who had personally complimented my writing took first, I felt some serious American pride. Turns out that Andy had taken his gloves off before his run to reduce wind friction, way before Jamie Lane became widely known as the pro who would ride without gloves no matter the conditions. Not too many people were shooting video of snowboard events, and even the biggest one in the world, sponsored by Suzuki Samurai that year, didn't get play on television. So that was it. I missed the opportunity to watch Kidwell take the U.S. Open, and I am still pissed about that one. Shortly after the Open, Gunstock jumped on the bandwagon and had a contest, but I couldn't talk the mountain manager into building a halfpipe. Snowboarding was not a big draw for customers. Groomed runs and moguls for skiers brought the big bucks. So, in true skier crossover mentality, the mountain held a snowboarding slalom race. I didn't bother to enter, but I did use the opportunity to stalk that GNU rep who showed up to demo boards in the parking lot. It never occurred to me that there were certain channels to go through or to get sponsored with. As far as I was concerned, here was a guy with a GNU sticker on his van and a bunch of GNU snowboards in the back. And I had, re and I had a reference from a professional snowboarder, Amy Howitt, so why wouldn't he just give me a board? After practicing various approaches, I decided on the casual, confident touch. I walked up to him and said, hi, I'm Todd Richards. Amy Howitt said you'd give me a board. Yeah. He tried his best to brush me off uh, as though he was looking like he was busy. Only problem was that no one was standing in line to try out GNU snowboards. So eventually he had to talk to me and he agreed to let me demo a board for the day. I don't think he trusted me because he also made me give him my driver's license, <laughs> but it was a start and I figured I could work, out the, work on the rep later. GNU was being touted as the future of snowboard designs and the company was claiming that their boards carve like no other when you set them on edge. After one run, I absolutely hated it. It was stiff as hell. The Elfkin bindings were like bear traps on my feet, and I kind of just fell trying to ride down the mountain. And catching air on that thing it was a joke compared to my soft and flexible switchblade. I returned the board after three runs, got my license back, and I figured I'd give GNU a couple years to catch up with Sims. 
My last snowboarding trip of the season was to Atatash Mountain, and it was with some friends. Well, my last snowboarding trip of the season was to Atatash Mountain with some friends, and I was determined to nail a method or a mute, or any trick where I had to straighten my back leg out in the air. I couldn't do it for some reason. For I could, you know, I could grab backside, I could do like little frontside airs, like tuck knee frontside airs, but for some reason, I couldn't do airs like you'd see like Palmer and Kidwell and those guys in the magazine. I couldn't figure out how to straighten my back leg and grab a mute. It was weird. Um, so, yeah. The snowboarding, magazine, the snowboarding magazines had photo after photo of riders simultaneously grabbing their boards and straightening their back legs just like in skating. I could do it on my bed, but I couldn't figure out how they were doing it in the air. It was like my body just wouldn't work that way. At Atatash, I said, I'm gonna try this, I'm gonna do this, or I'm gonna die trying. On my last run, I launched off a slushy knoll with a bunch of speed, and bam, I kicked my leg as hard as I could, and it locked out straight, and the nose of the board came right up into my hand. I was so shocked that I didn't let go, and I ate shit. But I was pumped that I finally got my body into that position in the air. That day was the last time I'd ride until the following November, but it was a huge breakthrough. Snake or be snaked. There is a certain etiquette to skateboarding on vert ramps. In the simplest terms, you want to give people their turn. You want to give other people their turn. I, on the other hand, was ruthless when I dropped in. Once I got rolling on the ramp, I would totally zone out, oblivious to the people who were waiting for me. Indoor skate ramps had become fashionable on the East Coast in the summer of 1988, and Muzzy and I acted like we owned the big one at Zero Gravity in Nashville, New Hampshire. There is a shot of me doing a Andrecht at Zero Gravity in Nashville, and I'm super stoked those guys put that ramp, um, put that ramp there. Super hyped. Uh, I'm actually, this, I'm really stoked in this photo. I think, um, pretty sure Trevor Graves took it. And I could never grab Andrex on my skateboard in between my feet. I'd always grab in front of my front foot, which is kind of weird. You don't really see too many people doing those that way, but I don't know. For some reason, that's just how I learned them. I wish I could grab behind my foot, but I just couldn't do it. Um, yeah, so Muzzy and I, we'd skate at zero gravity a lot. We would uh, take runs until the vert police told us we were hogging the ramp. We'd say we're sorry or pretend to be sorry, and we'd walk back up the ramp and do it again. All the edginess came from skating with ruthless kids when I was growing up. I learned how to snake really, really well and early on because there was no such thing as respectful pauses in which you could drop in. And the only way I could get runs was to snake. The standard motto was snake or be snaked, so I always was quick on the draw, getting my tail out and not looking when I dropped in. I was lucky that I never really slammed into anybody, although that same summer I did hit a dog. I was at ZT Maximus, an indoor skate spot in Boston, and it was a very heated snake session with a bunch of local hotshots. I timed going after a guy bailed. I dropped in without looking, just as somebody's dog was wandering across the ramp. Now, when a dog gets hit by a car or a skateboard or a person on a skateboard, at the point of impact, the uh, glands in the dog's butthole open up and they empty. I know you guys that have dogs, have ever had to have your dog's like butthole glands uh, lanced or squeezed. I don't know what they do with them. But um, as soon as you hit a dog or the dog gets hit, it instantly opens those and you smell like dog stink. And to make matter worse, I hear, oh shit, my dog. And there was one of my heroes, East Coast Pro, Fred Smith, running towards me and the equally dazed canine. Well, Freddie ignored me. He checked out his mutt, which was fine. And I limped to the opposite side of the ramp thinking, damn, I just T-boned Fred Smith's dog. Second year of college, barely. New Hampshire, New Hampshire Vocational Technical College almost didn't let me back in for the 1988-1989 school year because my grades were so horrible. I was still super pumped on skateboarding, but this was the first summer that I couldn't wait for it to snow. Somehow, I convinced my parents to keep paying for school and to get me an early Christmas present, a Sims Terry Kidwell signature snowboard with folding Sims high back bindings and a pair of Quimbola Man snowboarding pants. Kidwell wore Kumbola Man pants, as did Tim Wendell and a lot of other skate-influenced riders at that time. They were the shit, but the Sims board was the reason that I am where I am today. When it turned cold enough in November, gunstock started blowing snow, and I was there the minute the run was rideable. The run had little jumps on its edges, and in one day it all came together for me. 
I don't know if it was the magic of that kid wall board or the countless hours I'd spend strapped onto my board on my bed doing repetitions. I seriously would like work out on um, my bed, like trying to make sure, because the last, I, the last run of the last time I snowboarded that season was the first time I ever like grabbed a, uh, and tweaked an air properly. So I just went home and like laid on my bed and like would like practice a whole bunch of tweaks on my bed upside down. But whatever the reason, that opening day at Gunstock in 1988 was the first time I learned how to get my tweak on. I did rockets, I did double-handed rockets, I did mutes, methods, anything you could do by grabbing, the, grabbing towards the tip of your board and sticking your back leg out. At around the time I turned 19, the January 1989 issue of International Snowboard Magazine showed up. In it had Terry Kidwell on the cover doing a mute air from the kicker session at Loon the year before. As I showed you guys last night, there it is. That's shot by Trevor Graves, once again. Trevor Graves, shout out. Got my career going. Um, Trevor Graves had shot the photo, and I had been there, and I stared at that magazine cover for over an hour, feeling like I was on the inside of something really big. During Christmas break, me and Team Kemper guy, Paul Bobian, Fang, took a road trip to Sugarloaf Ski Resort in Maine because we'd heard they had a half pipe. When we got there, I attacked the pipe armed with my new grab tricks. I found out that the tricks I'd been learning were actually easier in the half pipe, and boning up my back leg actually helped with balance and landing the tricks. Paul and I took turns snapping photos of each other with my Kodak disc camera. And then, when we weren't riding, I'd study the snowboarding magazines. I'd study the snowboard magazines I brought along to try to figure out variations of the tricks I felt comfortable with. On the hill, I began to think I could actually ride a half pipe, and I told myself, I'm going to go and win some contests this year. The first contest of the 1989 New England Cup was at Gunstock, but it was really only a slalom, so it didn't even matter. The next event was in February at Sunday River, Maine. I fell on my first run on the half pipe and ended up back in the pipe practicing while the award ceremony was going on. Jason Ford, who was following in Craig Kelly's footsteps as the all-around guy who ripped at racing in freestyle, won that event. That was the first time people really took notice of Jason's freestyle abilities. Waterville Valley was next, and a guy named my age named Noah Brandon was there. On my wallet school, I had a picture of Noah wearing a Thrasher magazine t-shirt with dreadlocks flowing behind them and pulling a method air out of Breckenridge's half pipe. Guaranteed he's going to obliterate me in the pipe, I thought to myself as I watched Noah's practi Noah practice. I saw his skate style. Noah is the smoothest human being that's ever ridden a snowboard, by the way. I mean, yeah, he pretty much is. You can't really deny that. Um, I saw his skate style. He was so damn good, so damn cool, and so damn nice at the same time. He was the first person I ever met who came across as a gentleman snowboarder. No attitude, and he just let his snowboarding do the talking. And that, I thought, was something to aspire to. Brushy showed up at Waterville, too. He'd been off riding with Craig Kelly, whose all-black board was called the Mystery Air. It wasn't really a mystery, since everyone knew the story behind the Burton versus Sim sponsorship deal. Once it was settled, the Mystery Air would become Craig Kelly, the Craig Kelly Pro Model. So, um, Brushy, at that point, was riding a... It looked like the old Burton Air, the old black Burton Air that had the three round dots that said Air on it, except... It was on the other side of it, it had Craig Kelly's signature on it. It was like a Burton Air with Craig's signature. This is like the pre, uh, the pre board to the one with the, um, uh, like the orange and red and all that stuff. So yeah, Brushy was riding that there. Brushy's half pipe style and skill had really progressed since the previous winter. He was wearing tongues on his boots a Craig Kelly trademark that helped increase edge control with your board, and shit, he was riding his board backwards. He was doing half cabs and looking even more like a skateboarder. I went into that half pipe contest thinking, well, I was hot shit, but then I saw Brushy and I realized that I wasn't. There was maybe 30 guys in the men's division and about 12 in the women's division, steep competition. I got third place, Jason Ford took second, and he won the race as well, and Brushy won. Chris Swires, one of the kids I'd met while trying to skate the vert ramp at University of Vermont the year before, he and I rode together a lot the winter of my second year in college. I'd drive to Vermont instead of going to my classes and would try to push each other to learn new tricks. If we could find a half pipe or just something resembling a bank in the snow, forget about it. We camped out for hours. This was an era when if you could put your hand on your board in midair, you were a standout on the mountain. And we used to... And... We got used to confused New England skiers stopping to watch us hit jumps. They didn't get it. 
One day a skier came up to me and said, why do you grab your ski board like that? And I told him, so it won't get away. Somehow this sarcasm escaped him. The board can't get away because it's attached to your feet. And he nodded and went back to his friends who had elected him to come and talk to the weird ski boarder. They all nodded in agreement and some of them waved at us. It was fun to toy with unsuspecting wanker two plankers and I'm certain they considered us equally as pathetic. Snowboarders were a novelty to skiers and skiers were old news to snowboarders. There was a total and utter lack of understanding which made the early days so much fun. That is 100% true. All right, so here we go. This is uh, moving on to shred and, dis shred and destroy snow skaters on ice. And this picture right here is the Sims, uh, kind of Sims crew, I guess, except I think Andy Coughlin's in that picture. So let's see, this is Lisa Vinciguerra. There's Brush. Yeah, this is definitely just the East Coast crew. This is at the Vision Pro in the Snow at Squaw Valley. There's Andy Coughlin. There is uh, Chris Swires, and that's me over there. This was like the first big contest I ever went to when I was, was riding for Sims. So yeah, that was good times. Chris Swires and I were on the same level and we felt confident enough to go to the US Open in March. We pulled up to the Stratton Mountain lot and immediately started picking out the pros we'd seen in the magazines. There was Palmer, Tim Wendell, Kevin Delaney, Keith Duckboy Wallace, Rob Morrow, and Andy Coughlin. As we were gearing up to catch the gondola, Coughlin introduced us to Brad Stewart, the team manager for Sims. These are the guys I was telling you about, Coughlin said. Brad was like, right on, good to meet you, and that was that. Swires and I were silent as we got on the gondola. We were both thinking, holy shit, Andy Coughlin had been talking to somebody about us? Later, we found out that photographer Trevor Graves, as well as Andy, and some other established pros were heralding Chris and I as up-and-comers coming from the East Coast. And I was actually, this I remember this, uh, this, Swiz was there, it was me, it was my good friend Alexi Garrick, and we were all at Stratton, and we had just, we had pulled in, this is like a, you know, first day, first day there. So this is, this is what happened. This is when snowboarding completely changed again for me. I looked out the window of the gondola and I saw a line of three snowboarders wearing black ripping down the mountain. They were airing off rollers, pulling super slow motion half cabs and grabbing tight next to their bindings, which is total skate style, unlike me with my extended nose grabs. We saw them later at the half pipe. The leader was Roach, Chris Roach, who had bleached white hair flowing out from the back of a black beanie. He was with Mike Ranquit and Tucker Franzen. Mike from Seattle and Tucker from NorCal, West Coast Riders, to be sure. Over the next few days, I kept an eye out for these three, especially Roach. The Open had a slalom, a giant slalom, and a halfpipe event. Sweeze and I only entered the halfpipe, and we had a lot of fun practicing in the best pipe we'd ever ridden. I stalled out at least one hand plant every run, timing a few directly in front of the Sims team manager, Brad Stewart, who was camped out near one of the better hits. In the competition itself, I did pretty shitty. I don't even think I qualified for the final heats, and I was so far out of my league. Craig Kelly took first, Burt Lamar second, Terry Kidwell third, and then Kevin Delaney. Palmer, and then way down in eighth place, Chris Roach. Kidwell was still my hero, but Roach's NorCal tight style, though not as smooth as Kidwell's or Kelly's, was raw and tight. It looked so skatey. And the second that he was in the air, he rotated so slow and grabbed his board for so long, it was like you were watching a movie in slow motion. From that contest forward, I wanted to ride like Chris Roach. This is the first time I ever saw someone hold onto their grabs so long it looked like they were going to run their hand over. And to this day, I think Chris is pretty much one of the only people that would hold onto their grabs that long. And Rankwood, too. I mean, Rankwood at that point was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And I think Mike actually, at one point during that contest, was uh, he was the announcer when he didn't make it uh, into the finals. So he was announcing, and it was freaking hilarious. This is also when Rankwood always had a cast on his arm. Like he rode with a cast on his arm for like years, years and years. After the contest, Brad Stewart came up to me and explained, even though I hadn't placed well, he saw a lot of potential in my riding and thought that I fit the Sims image. He said they'd been looking to add some East Coast talent to their uh, predominantly West Coast team. And my jaw dropped as he handed me over a used Sims half pipe snowboard with a white top sheet and the coveted Sims team logo on the nose. It was a hand-me-down from Kevin Delaney, who had just received next year's model. Then Stewart gave me a couple of Sims sweatshirts, a stack of stickers, and a pair of gloves. Chris, got, Chris Swires got hooked up too. 
So here we were, East Coast Regional Riders for Sims and the same team as Kidwell, Roach, and Palmer. It was the best day of my life. I geared up, adjusted the bindings on my new board, and went to the halfpipe where Trevor Graves was running around like a chicken with his head cut off, trying to get the best photos of the best snowboarders in the world. I pointed out the Sims team logo on the board, and he gave me a thumbs up. He already knew. In between shooting the real pros, Trevor had taken some photos of myself, grabbing the nose of my board, and sent them over to Sims. Life couldn't have been better. While at the Open, I heard about the first ever National Collegiate Snowboarding Championship, scheduled to take place at Stratton a couple weeks later. After a painful explanation to my college's sports program advisor about the legitimacy of snowboarding, she agreed to pony up the 100 buck entry fee. So I found myself back at Stratton Mountain in April for the inaugural NCSC. I signed up, got my bib, and headed to the half pipe, where I overheard a couple of kids saying, there's this Sims team guy here who's going to take the pipe. I looked around for a while trying to find who this other Sims team rider was before I finally figured out they were talking about me. I didn't enter the NCSC slalom race. I skipped it uh, because that's what Roach did at the Open. <laughs> In general, he either wrote, I don't see this. This isn't true either, I don't think, because Roach always did race. He always raced back then. It was actually pretty rad. In general, he either boycotted races or rode the courses backwards. That was more rankwood. Showboating by airing off the ruts. He was more interested in riding style than in speed. Winning a race meant nothing to him. It was a good thing I skipped the race too, since I would have suffered a beating from uh, the lowest division. There's me at the National Collegiate Snowboarding Championship. Cool, super cool. Probably felt pretty cool. Although it was mainly an East Coast event, people came from as far away as the University of Utah. Lisa Vinciguerra, representing George Washington University in Vermont, won both the slalom and the pipe and was named the overall women's champion. I came through and won the half pipe by hitting one big method error in a hand plant, and I think I even pulled a frontside 540. Winning my first half pipe event was really cool, but it wasn't like winning a pro event. I think everyone else fell on their runs, so I didn't really get that cocky. That would come later in my career. I called Sims to tell them, check it out, I won this contest. And the reaction was, what contest? Collegiate what? Never heard of it. I got the impression that they didn't really care. My self-defeatism took over, and I thought that maybe they didn't remember giving me the free board. Likewise, my parents' reaction was nonchalant as well. At that point, they didn't understand the magnitude of winning a contest, kind of like the skateboarding events I'd won in the past. I tell them, Hey, Mom and Dad, I won the contest. I took first place. And the response was basically, That's nice, sweetie. Can you pass me the milk? But I still had a free Sims snowboard, team sweatshirt, and team gloves. And it didn't bum me out that my parents didn't really get it. They were on the same page as the rest. Of it didn't bum me out that my parents didn't get it. They were on the same page as the rest of the world. Snowboarding was a fad. It would fade away into the next one. And I couldn't blame them. It wasn't like snowboarding was in the Olympics or anything. Sponsored pro, rookie year. Let's see, how much more we got here? I'm kind of, I'm in the middle of cooking dinner too right now, so I might have to bounce. I should probably mention that I graduated from college with a two-year program in May 1989 with an associate's degree in graphic stupidity. <clears throat> My entire education was rendered, ob rendered obsolete by a keystroke that same year that computers started to replace drawing boards and layouts were being done on screen. It's true, my entire education was like this on like Illustrator, like uh, Control X was my whole education, so. But it was, it was for a good time, it was for a good time. Um, so I was done with school, living with my parents, and I was thinking, what am I gonna do now? My parents read my mind and answered, well, you gotta get a job. And landing a job would be extremely difficult with my busy summer schedule of skateboarding and all. Then I received a letter in the mail from Sims that began with, I would like to take this opportunity to confirm that Sims Snowboards Inc. is interested in retaining your services for the Sims Snowboard team for the 1989-1990 season. Sims did know who it was. Not only that, they wanted to retain my services. I read that letter about a hundred times. It basically asked me to confirm that I wasn't writing for anybody else and that I didn't have any medical problems and that I'd get a bunch of free shit in exchange for my services. A contract was supposed to show up a few weeks later but it never did. So this is, that was the letter I got from Sims. I still have it. It's pretty awesome. It says, uh, yada, yada, yada. Dear Todd, I'd like to take this opportunity to confirm that Sims Snowboards Inc. is interested in retaining your services, blah, blah, blah. 
following summarizes the outline of the basic terms. Seems so provide the assorted free goods. Blah 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 blah. Your typical letter. <clears throat> In September, Trevor Graves called me up to say, I think you might be in the next issue of ISM. What's your address? I got a package the following week. Inside was the October 1989 issue of International Snowboard Magazine with a note that read, You're in the magazines now, kid. On the cover was Noah Selaznick with the blurb Shred and Destroy, the skater influence on snowboarding. Flipping through the magazine, I paused on the page Trevor had marked, and I stared at a photo of this guy dorking around inside, inside a, the lodge at Tenney doing a street plant on his skateboard with gloves on his feet. And I realized that was me. My first photo in a magazine, a three quarter page, black and white, and I had gloves on my feet doing a street plant on skateboard. I was a little bummed that it wasn't a snowboarding, I wasn't snowboarding in the shot, but I really couldn't complain. Next to my photo was Mike Rankwit flipping off the camera that, with a caption that read, attitude and action. On the opposite pages was, was a shot of Kevin Staub, Sean Palmer, Dave Lemieux, Jeff Brushy, and Andy the Pretzel Hetzel. Skating legend Gator and Matt Cummins, they were all shown on the following pages. I was surrounded by greatness in both the skating and the snowboarding worlds. From that day forward, whenever I flipped through magazines, I kept a shameless eye out for my shots of myself. Still, I never thought I was good enough to be in the magazines, and I kind of felt like I tricked everybody. So yeah, here's the picture. This is the cover of the ISM mag, and there is, there's picture Ranquit flipping everybody off. Where's the freaking lens on this camera? And then there's me doing a street plant. Actually, I think that wasn't at the Tenney Lodge. That was uh, at Rob Levine. Um, God, who had Rob Levine, Jason Ford, uh, and Noah Brandon, and God, I forget who else lived there. But they had this house outside Sugarbush called the Habit Trail. It was like this artist's house that they were renting that had like these weird little rooms and stuff. And yeah, that's, that's where that was. And we would skateboard inside the house. Hmm. Interesting. Um, fall rolled around and my dad explained to me that two free t-shirts and that photo in the snowboarding magazine were great and all, but really you need to get a job. Dragging my feet on the job issue wasn't going to carry me through the winter. I passed on the opportunity to pour concrete for, for a construction company and winter pizza delivery on the East coast is way too hazardous. So I ended up going to, the work, going to work at the ski market, a shop at the base of Mount Wachusett, about 20 minutes from my house. Shortly after I got the job, the brown Santa brought me a bunch of boxes, big boxes from Sims that contained two new black graphic snowboards, some sweatshirts, t-shirts, gloves, and a purple and green team outfit with a Sims team logo and my name embroidered on the chest pocket. I called Swiss to see if Santa had visited his place too, it had and then put my stuff on, strapped onto, into my snowboards, and jumped around in my bed until I was soaked with sweat. True story. The ski market required me to attend a bunch of mandatory sales clinics so I could learn about the different skis, boots, and bindings I'd be selling. I didn't pay any attention. I was only there for the free Mount Wachusett season's pass and to appease my parents so they'd continue to let me live at home rent-free. Somehow, I actually sold skis to people, like a used car salesman. The best thing about the job was the hours. I'd ride every morning and then work in the afternoon to the closing shift. Uh, then work in the afternoon to the closing shift. There weren't very many snowboarders on the hill and even a smaller crew of sponsored riders. Back then, if you had a team jacket, you were special. In my case, I felt like a big fish in a little pond, but I was really just a minnow in a puddle. I wore that team jacket everywhere to show off, even if it was 60 degrees out. It was the best thing since sliced bread. Mid-December, Trevor Graves called with a cool Christmas present. He said I had a photo in the January uh, issue of International Snowboard Magazine. A nice surprise because I'd begun to think Shred and Destroy article might have been my five seconds of fame. I was barely off the phone before I was in the car trying to hunt down the issue. Only two places in a 100-mile radius carried ISM, and they rarely had more than two copies. I don't know who the other two snowboarders were in Massachusetts who read ISM at that point, but both shops were sold out, and I was pissed. I drove around for another two hours and finally stopped at a little bookstore in Fitchburg about 45 minutes from Paxton. There in the magazine rack in the January 1990, the January 1990 ISM with Craig Kelly on the cover. It was like a weird kind of graphic. It wasn't like a, it was a picture, but it was like graphically manipulated. It was, I think it was actually, maybe it was a painting. Inside was the article my old friend Rob Levine had written about the in, inaugural collegiate championships and a three by five inch color shot of me doing a method air with a caption that read, Todd Richards doing his best Sean Palmer lookalike air. That's it.
that's the pick. I was very excited about that shot. <clears throat> as Palmer was widely regarded as the most stylish method man, I was flattered. Then I read the article twice, just to make sure Rob had, just to make sure Rob had really forgotten to mention that I won the halfpipe event. He mentioned the overall winners, Steve Hayes and Lisa Vinciguerra, who had both raced and competed in the, in the pipe, but I got barred. Well, so much for knowing the writer. Despite my superhero team jacket and superhero team board, I was still mild mannered. I was still a mild mannered wannabe. I wasn't very good at drinking, and I didn't do drugs, so courage was something I couldn't find in a bottle. The last time I drank anything was senior prom when I barfed all over my car and myself, and then I rolled around in it and went to sleep. Those magazine photos, however, did great things for confidence, and I took first place and second place at the first two 1990 New England Cup contests at Sugarloaf, Maine, and Waterville Valley, New Hampshire. Chris Swires took second and first, re respectively. No, actually, I think uh, Chris, I think, actually, the one that was at Sugarloaf, Jay Quinton, Smoking Jay won, I got second. And then at Waterville, I got first, and then Chris got second. Um, we did a good job of representing Sims on the East Coast that year. We both won big glass goblets and a couple hundred bucks each. Huge as far as I was concerned. My dad told me not to quit my day job. Late in January 1990, the new Sims team manager, Mickey Keller, called me. The Vision, the Vision slash Sims Pro in the Snow contest is coming to Squaw Valley, she said. I'll give you and Chris Swires a place to stay, but you got to get your butts out to California. I asked my manager at the ski market for a week off, and he wasn't so happy about it. He'd nicknamed me, the only snowboarder who worked at the shop, Agro, as in, like, I was totally way rad and aggro. And it came from, I think he was reading an issue of Transable Skateboarding I had there, and they used to have this uh, article in there called Agro Zone, and he was really entertained by the aggro thing there. And I had to lay down the law. I said, look, I got to go. I'm out of here. I quit if you can't give me the time off. Or maybe I just groveled a bunch and he finally caved. Either way, I got the time off and I headed to Squaw Valley with Chris Swires for the Vision Pro in the Snow. All right, that's it. I got to go finish dinner. But um, that was part six. Part seven, coming tomorrow.